Yes! <laughs> if you voted for the blue shirt, you lost. If you voted for the purple shirt, you lost. But if you voted for sizzle clothes, congratulations, my friend. You are the winner. I'm here. I'm David. He's telling me I'm supposed to insert ads. Uh, <laughs> I don't really need to do that. Oh, it's good to be back. And I, I dressed up for you, you know? I feel like our relationship has got to be taken to the next level. And so that means I need to be respectful of you. I need to honor you with this fascinating getup that I've got on here. It's even got its own bow tie. If you notice, there's gold leaf on the bow tie. It's not really gold. This was $88 at a costume shop, but it's, it's funny to pretend that it's very expensive. <laughs> Let's see what you guys are up to here. You're saying it's too darn funny. Yeah, David, hey there. How you been? He's back. What are you wearing? We love the sizzle. David Wilcock is Edgar Casey. Looking good. Oh my God, she is the coolest. Oh my God, this outfit. Yes, the outfit freaking rules. I mean, how could you ever be disappointed with an outfit like this? And of course, with the cigarette included, now you have an ensemble of behavior that you know, gets you awards. You can go to an award show. You can end up being very well informed about what's going on in the world just by having access to these tools. You see, this is a comedy tool. I have a prop here. And in a way, the, the jacket also makes you laugh. So when you put the two together, it's a very natural... It feels good, you know? You can kind of ease back in the chair. You can be happy. David, stop drinking Bud Light, it says. Well, this is, this is all I've got, folks. There's nothing else. But uh, I got I, we're going to do David Wilcock cigarette variations at some point. And what that means is that I'm going to ask you guys to feed me characters. Feed me characters that you want me to play. Right here, you can write it in here. Tell me, you know... Just start thinking about it, because we're not going to do it right now. But I want you to think about funny characters that you would like to see David Wilcock do that involve a dangling phallic cigarette that hangs out of his mouth pretty much in perpetuity, never really burns down, but accents the flavor of the voice that I'm using as I speak. This is what I really want to do. You know, my calling in life is really not science or spirituality. It's just smoking cigarettes on YouTube Live but not really smoking because I think it's disgusting. I just like the aesthetic. You know, it's this, it's, it's, it makes me laugh. And as long as I'm getting off on it, then I think it's probably going to be okay to assume that other people will laugh too. Although sometimes that turns out to be wrong. For example, if you're from New York and you're sarcastic, you probably don't want to be sarcastic in relationships. I'll just say that as a nice, easy way of saying it. So here's the deal, folks. We are going to be talking about it. Are you ready for this? Archangel Michael, the biological universe, and the soul's destiny. That is right. I am coming at you with some high-octane stuff here because I have been living in seclusion in this house for two years, getting a, a higher education, if you will, from a parallel university. And in this case... The parallel university comes in the form of angelic beings who, if you watched last week's show, I was first in contact with them telepathically beginning in the year 1996. That was when I started following the principles of remote viewing, and I was able to produce results that had a spoken voice that appeared to be right away some type of higher consciousness. Now, we're not used to the idea necessarily of higher beings, but this was unavoidable. Uh, it was very personal. The contact knew all sorts of things about me that uh, were not available to anyone else. And also, my own burden of proof was satisfied by the fact that I spent so much time dealing with accurate prophecy. I mean, it's hard to explain this, but Every time that I sat down at the desk to do this work, to transcribe these cassette tapes, there would be a time loop 
where whatever it was just describing uh, in the tape that I'm now transcribing is something that I had actually been experiencing and something that I'd actually been seeing out in the world. So like there was a toy called Tamagotchi where you feed this little chicken and if you don't keep pushing the buttons on this little orange toy that the bird is going to die. Oh no. Well, I had that experience of seeing a little girl feeding her Tamagotchi at a local convenience shop. I go back home and I sit down and I start transcribing and sure enough, the exact same type of toy, the exact same type of little girl is in the dream. Uh, I think Phantom Menace Star Wars Episode One came out around this time, I believe, or one of them. And I went to see that and there was all kinds of interesting crossovers when I got back from the movie where the transcript was describing things I'd just seen in the movie right before then. So this is very fascinating. And when we talk about the soul's destiny, we're talking about an opportunity to live a different life where we no longer are bound by what we thought reality really is. The whole notion of reality here has become incredibly plastic in today's world. We can't take for granted the things that we thought were so solid. We, we used to call them institutions, and with the word institution comes the idea that you can buy stock in it, you can get an education in it, you can be safe and secure in your life with this institutional assistance. Universities, hospitals, and now everything has been turned upside down and a lot of people have no idea what's going on and who to trust or who not to trust. And I feel your pain. I mean, it's a very hard time to be alive right now. I've got to say that. It's, it's not easy to be here on earth at this time. And you're probably suffering just like I'm suffering. I mean, it's, it's, it's very intense. And I would like to remind you that it's not going to stay this way. I've studied the cyclical patterns of history and wrote a whole book about it called The Synchronicity Key in which we discuss how history repeats itself in regular units of time. And uh, when you see this happening, there are certain crisis points where in a very short burst of time, all of the events that led up to that crisis come to a head and they converge. And so that crisis point doesn't last very long. It's typically only a few years in any of these cycles, but that's where all the biggest stuff, it's so funny, I look over at you guys' comments here, right? And then it's, it's, it just goes faster and faster as I look at it. Cause I'm thinking, should I look at the comments? I don't know, I, I'm kind of on a roll here. I wanna keep going. I had such a horrible day yesterday in this house and you have no idea how bad it was. Okay, check this out. I just want to show you something. Both of these smoke alarms, <laughs> well, we, we had to rip them out. And the reason why is that when the house was built some 20 years ago, uh, these guys have a terminator cell in them as it turns out. And so even if you change the battery, it just says, nope, F you. We're too old, we're not going to work anymore, and we're not, going to, we're, we're not going to work for you. So I had my smoke alarms go out on me for two and a half hours, this beeping is happening. And then what was so strange was that not only did one of these two things go out where you put the battery back in, it's still beeping, but I also had a separate carbon monoxide detector smoke alarm that I had also unplugged and thrown into a box in the closet. And that started beeping and dying at exactly the same time as the other smoke alarm did. In my bedroom, in the middle of the night, somewhere between 5.30 and 8.30 in the morning yesterday. And by the time I got up, the dog was so traumatized that she had to immediately go outside and then she had to immediately go outside again. The wind was insane. The cold was insane. And then the next thing you know, I got the fire department here and we could not figure out what was beeping. It was like there was some kind of time bomb in the house, you know? So we literally, I mean, these guys, I had basically off officials in my closet yesterday ripping through my stuff. The very serious look on his face, is this, is this what it is? 
are you sure that this isn't beeping? I'm like, dude, I got this in Kentucky. <laughs> like back when I lived in Louisville, Kentucky, or actually Milton, some guy on the phone was really, you know, so excited. He was an old man. He called me up as a telemarketer. He was so excited about this phone that I've never thrown it away, even though, you know, your, your phone company has to be compatible with this. I mean, it's basically useless, but I even put black tape over it because it had this big red light on it. You don't really want that flashing all the time. So, but anyway, the point is that this became a potential smoke alarm that was beeping. That's how desperate we were. Okay. Just to show you another thing with an equally serious and crazy look on his face, the fireman said, are you sure it's not this? And I'm like, okay, look, we'll just, these are hard drives. I don't think they beep. I'm pretty sure they don't, but you know what? If it's going to make you feel good and it's due diligence and professional firefighting behavior, you know, I'm happy to take these out of the closet so that if they beep, that we'll hear the beep over there and we'll know that it moved. Well, it turned out that it wasn't these. And, <laughs> and this is all true. None of this is fake. They even speculated as to the possibility that this microphone case was the bomb. Because we thought, you know, I mean, the beeping was so horrible. And then he ha had to keep firing off all the smoke alarms in the house. Whew, it was so intense. It was so intense. I was crying when they left because it had been so noisy for so long. This was not a ticking time bomb, as it turns out. I said, look, you know, I think there really is nothing else in here except for a microphone. It doesn't have batteries, you know. There's nothing going on here. Uh, it's not this, I promise you. But we couldn't find it, and the thing kept beeping, and I'm like, oh, my God, are we ever going to... I didn't know if I was going to be able to do the show, because if that thing was still happening, I probably would have had to leave here. I wouldn't have my rig to do the live stream on, I would have had, everything would have been crazy. So finally, thank God, after, they stayed here for 90 minutes and they finally found it in this box, some carbon monoxide detector. Who the heck needs that, right? Just, yeah, that's ugly, let's throw that away. Well, yeah, you probably wanna leave that plugged in, as it turns out, I discovered the hard way. So it's been quite a ride. It's been quite an amazing, amazing journey here. And uh, I wanted to show you guys something here because we actually have some intel for you guys today. It turns out that the uh, Biden administration has been secretly allocating millions and millions of dollars to GSU or Gender Studies University. That's right. That's right. There's, there's been secret uh, slush funds that have been earmarked to create these very special institutions for higher learning. We want to elevate gender studies into a hard science, you see, because right now it's a soft science. And so in order to get it stimulated into a hard science, it's necessary to build these universities. GSU, it's, it's, a, it's very important, you know? So Wichita, Kansas, pretty much anywhere in Vermont, uh, Provincetown, Massachusetts, San Francisco, you know, so there's these secret cells of GSU that have been covertly financed and they're actually doing scientific research. And once they come out in the open, there is actual real possibility to find out more about yourself, you know? And so this is a fascinating thing. I'm really excited about this because they have a plan that I stumbled over in these leaked documents where they want to figure out how to make you, are you ready for this, gayer today. Yes, folks, you too can now have the opportunity to get leaked classified information directly from Gender Studies University about exactly what it takes to be able to be a satisfied student in this rapidly emerging new science. I'm very, very delighted to bring you this information. So this is some of the leaked data that's come in from the documents that just spilled online. Everybody's like really, really upset about this right now, you know? The first thing that we find out about being gayer today <laughs> is that it's all in the voice. So in other words, in order to properly develop your persona, 
for this university, it's necessary to understand that if you want to be, let's say, appreciated by the student body, yeah, if you want to be appreciated, you probably need to learn this, this particular voice technique, okay? So we're going to go through this. First of all, it's incredibly important to introduce pitch variations into your voice. So normally, normally you might talk like this, but if you want to be gayer today, if you want to sound more gay, then you want to start bringing your voice up and down, and you want to have all these extra... Now I sound like I don't want to say. But you have to, you have to lilt your voice, and we'll get more into this as time goes on. But this is science, okay? This is very important that you learn these things. So then what you end up doing is you create inspiring melodies with the sound of your voice. And that's, that's you know, the part of the, the whole technique. You then want to bend up or down from one note to the next. So, you know, the Gender Studies University staff have discovered that where uh, in, in conventional speech, your voice just has a, a uniform pitch point, okay? You typically hold one pitch. If you want to sound more gay or gayer, then what you have to do is you have to start bending your pitch from one to another. Oh, that's a pitch bend, okay? You can go oh, up, or you can go oh, down. And this is important because in order to uh, have the voice, which, which is basically your social signal, it's important that this, that this lilting occurs. Okay, let's go to the next piece of science here. So, you exhale through your nostrils to enhance the effect. Now, this is, this is actually very, very significant and something that is often missed in, in the academic literature. The real key to making your voice sound as, as homosexual as possible is to aspirate some of the air through your nose as you're talking. So I'm now going to try to combine the techniques because what, you're, what you want to do, okay, is, is by opening up and having a little air come out of your nostrils, you basically expand the palate and then the whole nostril area begins to vibrate. Now I gotta take a drink of water. This is very scientific, it takes practice. Okay, so just hold on a sec. Have to breathe. So whereas normally you would talk like this, if you blow a little air out of your nose, it's going to sound like that. Okay, so that's the technique. You want to talk and have the air, almost like you have a cleft palate, and the air comes out of your nose. So that's part of it, but then you also want to get the lilting thing. So it starts to sound, that's the other thing is the S's, okay? There's a lisp. We'll get into that in a second. We're not quite ready to do the whole voice yet. All right, let's keep going. You got to add strong emphasis to everyday things, and that means that, you know, uh, it's important that you're very excited about whatever you're talking about. So to master the technique of being a, a, an admitted member of Gender Studies University, you want to fulfill the desire of what it means to be gay, because gay is happy. So you're very, very happy. All right. And uh, you want to eliminate all sense of fear or shame as you speak. This is not going to be convincing if you're nervous, if you laugh too much, if you have any self-consciousness, you really do need to just throw yourself into the character with full abandon and just go for it. And then again, it's, it's, the, it's the mastering of the different techniques. Lastly on this list, you want to project confidence, openness, and trust. You're building a relationship with someone. You want to uh, let them know that you have no shame whatsoever about the way that you're talking. All right. So, to continue. Another tip that we give you in Gender Studies University is that you... <laughs> Uh, you got to go where the gayness is, folks. Come on. You always want to carry a glow stick. This is very important. It helps you signal. You know, you want to signal and let other people know what's going on. So it's, it's, it's important to do that. 
The comments are so funny. People don't always get comedy. This is satire, folks. There is no gender studies university, just so we're clear. <laughs> anyway, I'm having fun with this. Maybe we'll come back to these slides a little bit later. But the point is, <laughs> I've got to do something to keep myself entertained. I wanted to have a little bit of fun with you guys. And it, it's, it's, I think it's really sad that the elite are trying to polarize us against each other. And I don't think that it's a good thing to have so much tension and division going on. And so to be able to laugh, to be able to have a lighter attitude, I think is important. I don't want to see people getting into fights. Part of what's happening here is, is a polarization. They're trying to polarize us. They're trying to make it so that you're either on one side or the other. And, uh, you know, it's, it's not fair to the people who are just trying to live their lives, which is the vast majority, and they're not falling into this stuff. Just like we saw back in the Middle East, right? There's a small minority of people who are uh, heavily radicalized, and then everybody else uh, adheres to that. And so since somebody spoke about the Bud Light thing, isn't it strange that uh, Hell's Kitchen, which is a predominantly gay area of New York, that the sales of Bud Light went way, way, way down, like 70%. So I don't think that, I don't think the gay community is, is going along with this anymore. And uh, it's, it's definitely something that, again, for me, I feel like let's try not to hate each other because that's what they want. And there's a much, much bigger thing going on here than all this kind of stuff. So let me, let me jump ahead. We'll save some more of these uh, GSU slides for later. But uh, I want to talk to you now about the main topic here, which is this concept of life and how life is going to spontaneously manifest. This is a very, very fascinating experiment from Dr. Luc Montagnier. And the experiment involved taking DNA that was free floating in a tube with water, then energizing the tube and having this coil around it. So where you see it says generator seven hertz, that is the electrostatic generator that creates something similar to the Schumann frequency. And the Schumann frequency is the base electromagnetic resonance around the earth. So <laughs> you guys weren't quite ready to go gayer yet. I'm sorry. The comments weren't quite there, but we'll get there. We got to just go through it gradually. <laughs> anyway, so what you can see here is that on the left-hand side, there's a tube that has DNA over the top of it. And on the right-hand side, we have a series of empty tubes. And those tubes just have regular water in them. You see the word water. And then it says 18 hours next to the word water. So all that Montagnier was doing in this experiment is he was energizing the tube that has DNA in water and the tube that has just plain water with this electrostatic energy. And... Sure enough, DNA grew in the non-living water, supposedly non-living water. So this is what we're going to see now is a study that actually came out in New Scientist where it says scorn over claim of teleported DNA. A Nobel Prize winner is reporting that DNA can be generated from a teleported quantum imprint. A storm of skepticism has greeted experimental results emerging from the lab of a Nobel laureate, which, if confirmed, would shake the foundations of several fields of science. If the results are correct, says theoretical... Oh, we, well, we got to get to that. So that's where this quote comes in. All right, so we're going to meet here in just a second theoretical chemist Jeffrey A. Reimer from UC Berkeley. And just like you would expect him to do, he is parked in front of a chalkboard with equations, and he has an impressive academic background, as you can see, CBE Chair Warren and Catherine Schlinger Distinguished Professorship in Chemical Engineering. His focus is on material chemistry, applied spectroscopy, alternative energy, and nuclear spintronics. So then again, when we go back to this paper and we see the quote that he actually gave, and remember, this is a high-octane guy. I mean, I just explained to you that he's, he's got all these professorships and he's, he's a distinguished laureate. And, and so 
well, maybe not, a, I don't think he's a laureate, a Nobel laureate, but he's got all these distinguished professorships. So this is what he actually said, folks. If the results are correct, these would be the most significant experiments performed in the past 90 years, demanding a reevaluation of the entire conceptual framework of modern chemistry. Well, what are we really talking about here? We're saying that the, the life is emerging in water. And if it's that easy for it to accomplish that, just with DNA being resonated nearby in another drop of water, then why can't we have, you know, all the universe filled with life? Well, that is the answer. Uh, what this scientific discovery really shows us, let me click back to this slide. Yeah, it's the most, one of the most experiment, significant experiments in the last century almost demanding a reevaluation of everything we think we know about chemistry. So it's incredible to find out that this is happening. And it's one of the most intrinsic aspects of the living universe model that I've been teaching all these years. And I find it really incredible. Uh, and it's also really underappreciated because remember that if it works for DNA, if it works for little bacteria, it can work for larger life forms as well because life is just a multicellular organism, but the DNA has the code for all that extra complexity in it. So once you get this, uh, let's go back again, see the experiment here. So once you see this thing actually working, it's very, very amazing. So the next thing that you've probably heard me talk about many, many times, and I just wanted to bring it up again because it is one of my all-time favorites. <coughs> Pardon me. Whoo! <coughs> I went down the wrong way. <coughs> okay. The study of geometry and fluid vibration, you've seen me say this many times before, but it's totally worth repeating it again now. What, what are we seeing right here? What is this? This is nothing more than a drop of water with little fine particles of sand in it. And then what you're looking at here is just the sand being white and the water being the dark color. Now, why is it in a geometric pattern? That shouldn't happen, right? Well, the only thing that we've changed is that we've added vibration. So the vibration causes this geometry to spontaneously materialize, which looks like the Star of David. And again, you know, as we look at it here, it's, it's very shockingly geometric. It's got two in, interlaced triangles. Then there's these loops around the outside. And, you know, when you change the frequency, this is what happens. If you play one sound, all the sand magically assembles into the Star of David shape. If you play another sound, you get this cube. So again, and here this next slide shows it even better, these are different variations of the sand particles magically assembling into some kind of geometry. But let's go back to this one again for a second. All right. So why do I bring this up? I bring this up because I don't think I've actually done these slides in a regular YouTube live video before where we talk about this geometry like I just showed you appearing in consciousness. For many, many years, I've been working on a unified field model of the universe, uh, which was guided by things like extraterrestrial, alleged extraterrestrial teachings from the law of one, crop formations that have sacred geometric patterns in them, and all the way back to when I first got online, and I'm telling you guys last week about Art Bell was the top show, and Richard C. Hoagland was one of the top guests, if not the top guest. Uh, Hoagland's book, Monuments of Mars, talked about that there was a face on Mars, that there was a sphinx-like uh, aspect to it where it had a humanoid face on one side and then a lion-like face on the other side. And the Sphinx on Earth is a human and lion mixture. So that's very interesting. And then next to this face on Mars is a city of what obviously looks like pyramids. 
So apparently there are archaeological expeditions that we're going to be able to make. As I've been saying to you, we're, we are going to have uh, spaceships in the future. This is part of what I've been developing with Stavati Aerospace. And Mars is one of the coolest places we can go. There's some very, very exciting stuff there waiting to be discovered. And the pyramids and the sphinx, the face, all this stuff is included in that. So in Richard C. Hoagland's book, Monuments of Mars, I got it in 1993, he was describing this physics that he believed the monuments talked about. And it was this idea of a tetrahedron, which is a very simple geometric pattern. In fact, it's basically what you see here on the right. You put the tetrahedron inside a sphere and I don't really have this illustrated because I didn't know, you know, I wanted to have some slides and I also wanted to, you know, just improvise as well. Had to get you gender studies university. It's very important. Now it was highly classified. A lot of people, you know, nearly died for that information. So it's as much as we can take in one week. You know, maybe next week you'll get another lesson if you're good, but we'll, we'll see how it works. I mean, you know, I will warn you in advance that the fetish whip is one of the lessons, okay? Now this is designed with, I'll show you up close, it has leather, it's actually, it comes together in a very funny way, causing this, so there's a technique, you know, you're going to have to learn how to use this effectively and with compassion, because honestly, you know, you want to do this lovingly. This is a very important loving gesture. And there are glasses that go along with it. If you choose to wear them, you can wear these glasses as you use the fetish whip. And this helps to create a fantasy for someone that they can, that they can always remember. You know, you're giving them a quality experience that they're never going to forget. So GSU is probably a very good use of taxpayer dollars. Honestly, I think so. Anyway, so this stuff exists in your mind. This is consciousness geometry, and consciousness geometry essentially underpins the whole universe. So where this becomes so significant is we can, we can actually see, first of all, how it builds up from single unit spheres. And this is something I've talked about before, but this might light some bulbs in your mind. If we take four spheres of equal size, we put them together, we get a tetrahedron. So it's that simple. That geometry I was just showing you can be built out of four marbles of the same size. Now, in this case, we've only added another, what is that? One, four more on the outside, and now we have the exact same shape that I just showed you in water. That is the interlaced tetrahedron. So. If you are having any trouble visualizing the geometry, uh, what I'm trying to talk about, how it would work, it's, it's, it's actually holographic. It's a fractal of a single sphere that bubbles out into these other spheres that are all the same size, and then they compact. And as they come together, they make all the different geometry that we see in the fluids that are vibrating. It's very weird. So then we get this, uh, this is the octahedron, and you have four in the middle, one on top, one on the bottom. And this is looking at it from the top down, and then four more put around it. So you see, you get these beautiful complex geometries that start to form just with single individual marbles. And then this would be where you have an octahedron with a cube on the outside. So all of these things are entirely possible. So now I want to get into the main course and, and why I decided to use some slides because if you've seen my other YouTube videos, I've talked about many different things that involve geometry that are highly fascinating. We can, for example, look at atoms and molecules and figure out that all of the stuff we learned in high school about protons and neutrons needs to be redone. And I always had trouble with chemistry class. That was one of the classes I really didn't do very well in. but now I know why. It's because my intuition wasn't really clicking on it. It didn't, didn't really work properly. So in some of my other works, I've talked about the Dr. Robert Moon model of the atom, where the geometry that I was just showing you in that fluid occurs inside the nucleus. And it's built from what? Protons. It turns out 
that protons are sort of the same as the close-packed spheres in those diagrams I just showed you in terms of how they build geometry. So now, if you think back to the pictures I just showed you, I'm not going to jump back to them, but that's really what's happening inside the nucleus. And so once you start thinking about it that way, it's like, oh, okay, so protons are individual building blocks that make this sacred geometry that we're looking for. So it shows up in so many weird ways, and I think the crop circles were really trying to alert us to this. They wanted us to be aware of the fascinating relevance of this to our own lives, that we are surrounded by this geometric information. And, and then again, the question is really, okay, David, you're talking about a fluid that's vibrating, but what is the fluid? I mean, I think people might have gotten caught up on this or confused by this in some of my previous talks, but the bottom line is that the geometry itself is consciousness. It is the, the energy of mind. And you say, well, yeah, sure, you can make that statement, David, but that sounds really, really arbitrary. No, it's actually not arbitrary at all. We have scientific proof, because that's what I'm all about. That and maybe the fetish whip, you know, but it, it all depends on which show you want to see and what time you show up, you know. But hey, I didn't write the rules. Look, so here we go. This was a thing that showed up in, uh, I forget where it was exactly, but you can look this up online, look up the title. It is totally an amazing, amazing article by Signa Dean. The human brain can create structures up to 11 dimensions. We found a world we had never imagined. This is a mainstream media publication. So when we look in on this, what we see on the left is a network of neurons. It looks like some kind of... Uh, painting, right? That's probably worth... If Jackson Pollock did... <laughs> if Jackson Pollock did that painting, it would be very, very expensive. But in this case, it's just neurons. And maybe, maybe his brain was so close to the painting surface that he just painted his own brain. We don't really know. But anyway, you have these colorful neurons, rainbow colored. Hey, everybody! You gotta put it up in your nose. There's all these special techniques, okay? It's very important. We're gonna be training you as we go along. So... On the right, what we have here is the geometry, which their computer modeling actually showed. So let's get a little bit closer on that. So as hard as this might be to believe, folks, what you're actually seeing here is a diagram of this geometry that they found inside your mind. What do you mean geometry inside your mind? I mean that your brain is built to have these bundles of neurons that naturally cause these geomet geometric patterns to form where they're firing off all the corners of the bundles at the same time. In other words, looking back on this again, the geometry moves as a shape. It rotates, it spins. It's not just sitting still. These are, these are actively in motion. And then what you see there along the edge is kind of like the event horizon. So, we're going to get even a little closer here, and you can see, sure enough, definite octahedrons, definite what looks kind of like star tetrahedrons, some other very interesting shapes. I mean, this is what's actually happening inside your brain? How could a geometry... Whoops. How could a geometry be in all these different places at the same time? How could it connect into all these nodes of neurons as if it behaved as a single unit. Well, this actually suggests that the shape itself is the thought. And that as you, in the process of thinking, you are creating these geometries. But I want you to hear it from them, not from me. So again, here is the, here is the title slate. And now we're, oh, it's from sciencealert.com. There's the link. Okay, we finally got it. it says, uh, science discovers the human brain works in up to 11 dimensions. Last year, neuroscientists used a classic branch of math in a totally new way to peer into the structure of our brains. What they discovered is that the brain is full of multidimensional geometric structures. Hmm. The br Wait a minute. The brain is full of multidimensional geometric structures? Structures of what? 
we've autopsied brains for since I don't know whenever Diocletian and those guys were doing it back in Greece. You know, it was kind of a cool thing. But okay, um, we don't find geometry in the brain. We don't find any little uh, sculptures, right? So what is this? Well, again, it's it has to do with bundles of neurons and an invisible geometric pattern that you don't actually see. And this is why the crop circles were telling us to focus so much on geometry. This model was produced by a team of researchers from the Blue Brain Project, a Swiss research initiative devoted to building a supercomputer-powered reconstruction of the human brain. So that's what that illustration was. That was the supercomputer printout, the, the, the round edge of the thing, if you remember. It's like a fractal. It's like an event horizon. And the geometry is blossoming out of that. So the team used algebraic topology, a branch of mathematics used to describe the properties of objects and spaces regardless of how they change their shape. They found that groups of neurons connect into clicks. Here it goes. This is what I was talking about. And that the number of neurons in a click would lead to its size as a high dimensional geometric object, which is a mathematical concept, not one in space time. But it still has a tangible reality. I mean, you could say it's only mathematical, but there is a geometry that exists that's exerting force in multiple areas related to consciousness. So as this thing rolls around, you are thinking. As you, as you ponder a thought in your mind, this geometry is, is, is rolling around. And they'll say this in just a second. So we found a world we had never imagined, said the lead researcher and neuroscientist Henry Markram from the EPFL Institute in Switzerland. Here he is. And here he is posing in front of a brain. So he says, uh, we found, or this is from Catherine Hess, actually, another researcher on the team. She said, we found a remarkably high number and variety of high dimensional directed clicks and cavities, which had not been seen before in neural networks, either biological or artificial. Algebraic topology is like a telescope and a microscope at the same time, said one of the team, mathematician Catherine Hess from EPFL. So again, the idea here is that there's higher dimensional shapes in the brain. It's very fascinating. So here's Catherine Hess, and here she is at EPFL. You know, try to stay awake through the conference on algebraic and geometric topology, I dare you. <laughs> Try to stay awake as she writes these equations on the chalkboard, I dare you, you know? But, you know, if you've studied it enough, you'll understand it. So then they say, it can zoom into networks to find hidden structures, trees in the forest, and see the empty spaces, the clearings, all at the same time. Those clearings or cavities seem to be critically important for brain function. Hmm. Geometric cavities are critically important for brain function. And then again, it says, when researchers gave their virtual brain tissue a stimulus, they saw that neurons were reacting to it in a highly organized geometric manner. So if you actually just build the brain in a supercomputer and you do everything exactly the way the brain is made and you emulate it as much as you can, oh, wow, everything is geometric. What's going on? It's, the, the neurons are way too organized and they're all behaving like they're in a group. Well, again, we talked about how this geometry shows up as a vibration. So thoughts are vibrations. That's the idea. A particular thought has a particular note, if you will, that is its signature. And that signature exists throughout the universe, and it will always be there. You as a soul have a particular note and a particular signature that will always be there. It is as if the brain reacts to a stimulus by building and then tearing down a tower of multidimensional blocks starting with rods of 1D, then planks of 2D, 3D cubes, and then more complex geometries with 4D, 5D, etc., said one of the team, mathematician Rand Levy from Aberdeen University in Scotland. So here's Rand Levy. And again, the key is that the progression of activity throughout the brain resembles a multidimensional sandcastle that materializes out of the sand and then disintegrates. This is very, very different than our conventional view of the brain. 
and yet it all lines up with supercomputer modeling of what happens when you build the brain inside a computer. It's all about geometry. And then the question is, why do they say 11 dimensions? Well, for their term, a dimension is a point. So I'll show you this in the next slide. So, for example, on the bottom right here, you see what looks like a uh, pentagon, and it says five neuron click. So those five neurons are what they would call five dimensions. That's what they're doing. Each point is a different dimension in this system, but yet it forms into one spatial object. So then in this next image, uh, we're seeing actually the structures that they discovered in the human brain. I mean, this is really, really interesting that they actually found this stuff. The, the, look at how many tetrahedrons there are, first of all, A1, A2, A3, and you can see with the arrows that they're showing you how the tetrahedron is rotating. And then if you look over there on the right, they've got uh, these larger geometric patterns that they're not making into 3D objects. There's one that has, looks like seven points, and then one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. There's a, there's a septagon and an octagon there on the right. So they're finding these very interesting shapes in the mind. And uh, so here's a close-up on that image of the tetrahedrons. And they're actually showing how they rotate and they spin. And this one really blew me away uh, because obviously where my eyes are drawn to is the top left. So many crop circles have shown us illustrations of uh, octahedrons like this. That sacred geometry was illustrated in grass. And I went out there in 2000, what was it, uh, 10 or 2009. I went out to the crop circles and I took a tour out there with, with about 30 people and we had really, really stunning results because the crop circles uh, are bent but they're not broken. They bend at the growth nodes and if you actually study what happens, it appears that they are microwaved and that water heats up into steam and causes it to bend a certain way. Some of these crop circles have layers that can be up to four layers going in different directions and the only way they could be doing that is to, is to target each individual stalk of grain by itself. Like let's say they grab 10% or 20% and they all knock them down that way, but the rest are still standing. Then they do more in another way, more in another way. There's been eyewitness reports of crop circles forming where they just roll out into the, in, into the shape that they're in. Some people have heard a high-pitched chirping noise. Some people have seen a small white orb. Uh, if I'd known I was going to do all these crop circles, I, I would have brought these slides in. But I, again, I like to leave it open to wherever the, the talk wants to go. And I don't, I don't necessarily know that in advance. That's one of the beauties of being an intuitive. So I just take it where it wants to go. And if that's a fetish whip, that could be where it goes. You know, if it's a cigarette in my mouth, as we've already discussed, you know, I got those too. We're ready to do anything here. So this is, this is a close-up of that, of that geometry and it's, it's a very, very fascinating thing. And they also say that uh, although the findings provide a tantalizing new picture of how the brain processes information, they don't understand why this geometry is happening. More work will be needed to determine how the complexity of these multidimensional geometric shapes formed by our neurons correlates with the complexity of various cognitive tasks. So. They just admitted they really don't know what in the world they're looking at. What is this geometry? Where does it come from? Why is the brain doing this? Why do we see this in supercomputer modeling? It's, it's extremely fascinating. Uh, and to me, the real key goes back to what did we see that the geometry is? The geometry comes from vibration. And we have all these different spiritual traditions around the world that talk about the universe being created by vibration. In the beginning, there was the word, right? So, and the Hindus have the Aum. They tone this sound as the primordial sound, and they believe that that is the way that the universe was created. Well, it definitely appears that way. And I've gone into so much detail about sacred geometry, how the whole universe appears to have blossomed out of a 
small individual geometric object, which was the sacred tetrahedron we were showing you. Uh, so there's a lot to explore here. And the real idea is that when we combine what we saw about DNA manifesting spontaneously in liquid water with what we just saw here, I would argue that the geometry itself is some sort of force field in the universe that is causing these types of life forms to emerge. It's not only that it's conscious thought, it also creates conscious life. And so life is created by the geometry. The geometry itself is alive. It is conscious, it thinks, it makes biological life. So this is something I've talked about for so many years, this concept of spontaneous biological manifestations. There's very strange examples. There's a whole bunch of creatures that we see at both the North Pole and the South Pole, but there's no way they could have gotten from one pole to the other. They both evolved on each, each pole independently, supposedly, but they look the same. That's one of many things I talked about in source field investigations. So now is the time to understand that there's a reason why you never heard this before. There's a reason why this conscious science has never been presented to you. We have been sell, sold a bill of goods of, of, of a scientific paradigm that is deeply flawed. And we believe that we live in some type of material-centered universe where particles are reality. It turns out particles don't exist. The particles are really vibrational emanations of geometry. As I said, the protons around the nucleus of the atom, all that fits together when you start doing the close-packed spheres. We now know that there are preferential shells in the atomic nucleus that favor sacred geometry. So why would I also bring in Archangel Michael and the soul's destiny into this talk. We've already been going for nearly an hour and I haven't really mentioned Archangel Michael yet. Well, let's say that we take the knowledge of this geometry appearing in the brain and go a little farther out on the limb. Let's say that we are willing to argue that sacred geometry appears as a living information that, it, that it's, it, has, it has instructions. That the, the consciousness itself, the, the neurons, are not what we think they are. We believe thoughts are created in the brain. The brain really only seems to be like a catcher's mitt. And what is it catching? It's catching this geometry that comes in and rolls around. So what if... The geometry is your soul. The geometry is who you really are. It's just a way of measuring it as a vibration because this is what vibration looks like in a fluid. When you vibrate the fluid, if you have these tiny little sand particles in that cymatics thing I showed you, normally if you're not vibrating it, it's just muddy water. But when you introduce vibration, the water then crystallizes into this geometry. It's incredibly fascinating. So with all that said and done, the geometry exists apart from your brain. This is where we have to take a bigger leap in logic, is that, is that when your body dies, you are not dead. Your consciousness continues to exist, going all the way back to Dr. Raymond Moody in the 1970s, many other studies since then. It is an absolute, unequivocal scientific fact that near-death experiences occur, that people remember details, of these experiences when they're brought back and the details can be scientifically corroborated in many cases. I talk in the book about an example where somebody floated out of their body on the operating table and they saw a shoe on the top of the building. How could that have gotten there? They described it precisely and then they sent the maintenance crew up to the roof and sure enough the shoe was exactly where they saw it in their near-death experience. Even more outrageous is cases where people have a near-death experience they travel to visit someone they love, they talk to them, and then the person sees a ghost, and they're interacting with an apparition. 
But then the apparition goes back to their body, they come back to life, and they remember the conversation and all the specific details of what was happening while they were a ghost. And this also gets into another scientific piece of data that I didn't have a slide for, which is Dr. Peter Garyayev's amazing DNA phantom effect. If you take a piece of DNA and you put it inside a small room and you make it as dark as possible, there will always be a certain number of photons that appear out of the quantum vacuum, and those are called virtual photons. But virtual photons do not just stay where they are in the room. If you have DNA in there, all the virtual photons go into the DNA. The DNA, believe it or not, captures light, thousands and thousands of photons, and it holds the photons inside the DNA molecule. And there's a very, very long and fascinating discussion we can go into about biology and why your DNA holds on to light. It does appear that your DNA shoots out photons with specific frequencies in them as a type of biological code. So people are like, oh my God, how, what the heck is cancer? How do we solve the mystery of cancer? Well, back in the 1970s, the cure for cancer was discovered. And it was discovered by Dr. Fritz Albert Popp, P-O-P-P. -P. What did Dr. Fritz Albert Popp do? He actually studied carcinogens and he said, is there any common denominator that makes things carcinogenic? And it turns out that there is. Carcinogens all absorb light at 280 nanometer wavelength, which is ultraviolet. This is the wavelength that your cells use when the DNA holds on to photons. It, 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 it preferentially captures 280 nanometer light. So when you have a carcinogen, it actually stops your DNA from being able to hold on to those photons. Your DNA is stripped of light. And then what happens is that the light cannot get out to the cell to tell it to stop reproducing because normally it would shoot out a photon and the photon has information frequency that tells the cell to stop reproducing. So the cancer cells keep reproducing because you don't have the light to tell them to stop. Why is it that the miracle cancer cure always involves wheatgrass, juicing, you know, getting good nutrition, getting, getting this plant uh, nutrition? That's because a human, human skin only has 10 photons per square centimeter that come out but plant cells have a thousand photons per square centimeter. Plants are loaded with photons and when you eat vegetables, you're actually ingesting the light inside those cells and that light is then fed through your digestive system and your bloodstream. Because remember, oxygen is in your blood. There's a lot of oxygen in there and that keeps, that keeps a habitat apparently for this energetic nutrition. So there's, there's all these fascinating things where Dr. Fritz Albert Pop found that yes, we do know what, what cancer is caused by. It's caused by this light absorption. And therefore, if you target getting the light back into the body, then you can create these miracle healings. And so there's Russian science that involves, for example, rats that were given a toxin called alloxan that kills their pancreas. And then they're given new uh, light from another pancreas to shine through a laser beam and redirect it into their body. But it has pancreatic vibration in it. And then their body regrows the pancreas and they no longer have diabetes. So this all is the very primitive steps of what ultimately leads to things like med beds and lots of cool technology. And again, geometry is the key. That photons themselves have geometry in them Photons are captured light, and the light is geometric. When we look at it, we capture it under a magnetic holding container. We'll, I'll show that to you in the next show. Uh, but the whole idea of an afterlife and geometric thoughts now starts to get even more interesting because what if the geometry is even more intrinsic than we are? What if the vibration itself in its innate building block material form as geometry. What if that's really even a deeper and more intrinsic form of life? 
So these are just some of the building blocks that, that go into what I've done in the new Michael prophecies. Um, I have written incredible amounts of new stuff in the author's preface sections about this geometric model and how it applies to multidimensional consciousness, how it applies to explaining the zone of energy that our solar system is going into. This same geometric science actually explains why we're going to have a solar flash after 25,000 years. That we are drifting into a cloud of very advanced energy. So in book two, I've brought out the interplanetary climate change data and I've actually updated it. So there's new stuff in there that we didn't know before uh, about the planets. It's some very shocking photos. And again, the geometry is, is sort of a meta-consciousness. So there's like geometry in the Earth that we call the global grid. There's geometry in our solar system that determines how the planets are spaced apart from one another. And then there's geometry around our companion star that we're orbiting. And as we hit certain nodes of geometry, that's when the energetic activation occurs. So I've been given this kind of strange task by Archangel Michael, whatever you want to call it, this higher consciousness, to explain a lot of these missing pieces to us because we simply don't have any time. Why do I say that we don't have any time? Well, I, I say that because Archangel Michael has revealed uh, that we are going through a non-catastrophic rapture or ascension. Well, you want to use the Christian term? That's fine. In other words, as I said last week, it's not just 144,000 who are going to be ascending. It's everyone on earth. There's not going to be earth changes. This is repeated over and over again in the Michael books. Now, I saw some people in the comments last week, and they were like looking at the uh, slides that I had from the Hindu text, and it was talking about Kalki being the destroyer of all things. Oh, well, David's covering that part up. No, look, Michael makes it very clear in the Law of One and in the Michael prophecies that, because I believe that it's the same source, and I explain why, that there was a catastrophic timeline where Kalki would be seen as a destroyer. Okay, that was there, and that's pretty much what everybody was looking at. That's why so many of these ancient cultures seem to all have a doomsday prophecy. It was very disconcerting to me, you know, when I'd read these books and everybody's expecting a pole shift, which is like the earth slipping on its side and then these 200 mile an hour winds. Everybody's expecting some kind of solar flash that just burns up life on the surface of the earth. As I did more research, I found out there's plenty of evidence to back that up. In book two, I've got some really amazing stuff about the solar flash and this volcanic eruption from within all of the planets in our solar system that occurs when this happens. It is fully catastrophic. Super volcanoes like what we see in, uh, in Yellowstone is just one example of places all over the earth that just erupt when this happens and they, they shoot out a lot of material and everything gets buried and that's why Multiple insiders have reported that you find ancient civilizations below the surface of the ground. Ancient spaceships below the surface. Well, wait a minute, why are they buried so deep? Because periodically the earth does what the law of one calls a harvest, and part of harvest is tilling of the soil. That's why they use that word. So there's volcanic eruptions, there's this material that comes out, everything gets buried. And there also appears to be an angelic effort to save the life that they want to have saved when this occurs, like in the time of Atlantis in the story of Noah's Ark. And as we said last week, that was like the epic saga of Gilgamesh. So I got to take a drink of water. I'm talking too fast. It's incredibly fascinating to me that this situation has occurred where... Apparently, because of the, the efficacy of Jesus' mission spreading all over the world, I think that had a lot to do with it. There's 38,830 different denominations of Christianity. <laughs> think about that. And there's way more of them than any other religion. 38,000, almost 40,000 factions of Christianity. And in many cases, they argue about who's right. But, you know... 
we are living in a very real spiritual situation. I mean, check this out. How do you explain that between 4, four o'clock, let's go back to this one here. Between 4 o'clock, 4.30 and 8.30 in the morning yesterday, yesterday was one of the worst days of my whole life. This was so crazy. This little guy starts exploding. This little guy starts exploding at the exact same time. This is on some kind of 20-year time bomb that it was from, the, from when the house was built. It just says, nope, I'm done. This one I'd unplugged. It has a little plug on the back. I'm like, yeah, I don't need this, you know? So actually you do. And the battery had died. And they both died at the same time. Now, is that a coincidence? Well, most people would say, yeah, that's all it is. But it, it turns out that we are in some kind of a spiritual war. So what happened to me today, yesterday, was a negative greeting. You know, this is where you get attacked in this very strange way. How in the world do two completely, I mean, you can see they're totally different. One of them is made by First Alert. The other one is made by BRK Electronics, okay? So I don't even know if they share any of the same parts. And yet they both died at exactly the same time so that these guys are in my house for 90 minutes and we're in a panic because we keep trying to stop the beeping, but we can't find the other beeping. We stop one of them and then the other one is still going. And it was really bad. I mean, my dog got very traumatized. She started drooling all over herself. It was absolute insanity. And I actually cried really hard this morning because it was just so insane. So insane. But I said, you know what? I know why this is happening. I know why the smoke alarms failed, the house is screaming, my dog drags me out into this crazy, crazy windstorm, it's so cold, and I'm only in my long underwear, so I'm getting these cold shocks as I go outside. I've got basically what feels like cops in my house. They're ripping apart my closet. They're asking me if hard drives are, are the bomb, you know, and he's very intense and do you think this is it? And I'm like, I don't, I don't, I, I think that's just a phone, you know? <laughs> I think that's just a microphone. I think that's just a hard drive. Whew. I knew, I knew, I knew that the reason why this happened was that I'm going to do this show today and that it wanted me so upset and so demoralized that I would bow out and say, I just can't do it. I'm just too upset. I'm too traumatized. And I almost did. But I said, you know what? This is the picture perfect example of negative greeting. What are the chances that we have a biblical windstorm, that we have two smoke alarms fail at the same time? And I was supposed to be getting a massage yesterday, so I'd be all nice and relaxed for you guys. But then her kid gets sick and she cancels, like the night before, right before. So. Instead of having a nice, relaxing weekend to build up to this, I went through a, a biblical horror show yesterday. And I'm asking myself, okay, is this just a really bad thing or was there more to it? Well, it's, it's, it's weird, right? How do you get two completely different smoke alarms failing at the same time? When you start to understand that matter is made out of this geometry and that the geometry is really just a, a vibrational frequency, now you're getting past the notion of particles and you're getting into the idea of consciousness, that consciousness can project into a machine, whether it's a positive or a negative consciousness, because there is evil consciousness. That's what I believe this was. It was a very, very intense evil attack. Because, you know, that pitch that the smoke alarm makes is kind of right there at the same pitch point of like a child screaming to death. That's what it sounds like. My dog was so upset. Now, granted, it only happens every 30 seconds, but it's very loud. It echoes through the whole house. You don't know where the hell it is. And we were going crazy. They brought three different ladders in. The, the, whoever designed this house put the smoke alarm in the most dangerous, completely inaccessible location. It's almost impossible to reach it with any type of a ladder. That's why I called and said, look, I, I need you guys out here. This is crazy. Like the house is exploding, you know? So I didn't give up. I didn't stop. I still did the show right after. I mean, I felt so bad, but I'm like, you know what? I'm just going to do this stupid thing where I, where I hold up my shoe and I, and I do this title slate just like this. I'm recreating the title slate now. I got to move my finger like that, actually. I think it's like that. So I, 
I just posted it. I'm like, what the hell? I'll just say, you know, I'm going to wear gay clothes. I'm going to have fun and do a show for you guys. Because I am not going to be deterred by this weird, evil stuff that just left me to the point where I'm like shaking with trauma. I literally was shaking with trauma. It was so bad. So it's important to understand that there is a spiritual war going on in this world and that there are entities that feed in to either side. So the law of one has some very interesting perspectives on ascension and how this all comes together. So I want to do these slides now because it's I'm right on the on the topic here. So again, the idea is Archangel Michael, if you read Michael Prophecies, which I highly recommend, we have it uh, still on discount. There, you can still use the, the coupon code A-S-C-E-N-S-I-O-N. That's A-S-C-E-N-S-I-O-N, Ascension. You can type it all uppercase or lowercase. We've got it now set for everything. If you go to thedisclosure.com, type in Ascension, you'll get $22 off. And what I'm doing, and i got to make sure I explain it really clearly because a lot of people get confused. Archangel Michael, as I said before, dictated what now has become five books through me from November 1996 to the end of 1999. There's some additional material after that, but I, I haven't worked it into this edition yet. I, maybe I'll use it later. It's probably going to end up having time loops. All I've been doing now for almost two years is living in this house, which is utterly and completely unsuitable for the winter, by the way. This is really only a summer house, and I learned that the hard way. I've had incredible difficulty with wind and with cold. It's, it's, it's you know, eight months of winter a year. It was very cold this morning, as I said. It was snowing yesterday, and it's the wet snow in April is what we get, so it's, it's, it's hard to walk through. All of these things are, are now looped in. So the stuff that Michael was saying in the 1990s is now, like, button hooked with what I'm doing today, like a time tube, where if I have something going on over here, and this is what we call the present in 2023, it's showing up over here in the readings in the 1990s. And I think that probably the most compelling and stunning aspect of this material is the sheer redundancy of how many times they demonstrate accurate prophecy. And so what I've been doing is, I, I, I literally did run out of money. I had negative $1,600 in my business account. That's where it finally got down to. Uh, a couple things hit that I wasn't planning on right before I started to launch this. Now, why wasn't I doing any marketing before? Because I've been so obsessed with these books, with getting them done, uh, because I'm so excited about what it says. It's laying out everything that's going on in the world right now in meticulous detail. And this is five books that, by the way, at least the first three are all like around 450 to 500 pages. So don't look at it as if you have to read it all at once. This is something you'll enjoy for a long time because each one of these books are as good as any of the other books I've written, if not better. Because now it's the remote viewing results of my work in the 1990s telling us that we have graduated. Now, if for some reason this hadn't happened, if we hadn't graduated, I wouldn't have found these readings necessarily. And maybe we wouldn't have this opportunity, but because we have systematically passed all of our tests, we get to graduate. And it's very interesting. We've talked many times about the idea that this end of the world scenario that we're in now is equivalent to a divorce. But it's a specific type of a divorce where you actually are with a person who has what they would call narcissistic personality disorder or clinicians, clinical psychotherapists would call it psychopathy. Now, what is psychopathy? Is a psychopath Hannibal Lecter? Is he, is he, he wants to eat your brains? No. A psychopath is a person who has a, a, a brain abnormality. This is what they would say in my, in my college classes. And in, in the third volume, which is book two, volume two, the one I'm about to release, I've now done the scientific research so you can go back and, and recreate all this for yourself where I show 10 different regions of the brain that actually shut down 
in the case of psychopathy. And you may have heard that psychopaths do not have what appears to be any electrical activity in their frontal lobe of their brain. It's actually a lot more than just the frontal lobe. There's 10 different regions. And just to try to name some of them off the top of my head, you have uh, ventromedial prefrontal cortex, anterior cingulate cortex, temporal pole, uh, hippocampal, the hippocampus, the hippocampal gyrus, the inula. I mean, just what I've thrown out right there. Each of these areas of the brain, which we can read about, we can find out what they do. And yeah, this, is, this has to do with this part of, of, of your you know, emotions or thinking or whatever it is. We find up to a 20% reduction in the volume of gray matter. The actual amount of brain tissue decreases and there's no electrical activity. So in short, it appears that, that whole area is, is basically turned off. Another thing that appears to be happening is that fungus can grow in these regions once they're turned off because uh, certain types of food particles can get into your bloodstream and pass through the blood-brain barrier. So this is one of those weird secrets about autism. Why was it in the 1970s that they were curing kids' autism with the so-called fine gold, F-E-I-N-G-O-L-D, the fine gold diet? I remember kids in school. I grew up in school in the 1970s. I was born in 1973. I'm 50 years old now. I'm, I'm actually past my prime. That's why I got to compensate. So these kids would be on a fine gold diet, and the main thing is do not eat any grain at all. So there was a huge thing about this in the Law of One, too, where they talked about the sediment-free diet, that you don't want sediment in your food. Well, that means grains and particles, because the particles get into your bloodstream through these uh, rips in the gut lining that we all have, and it's very difficult to heal and get rid of all that. Most of the food that we eat is causing these things to happen. So we're not eating the right food, there's rips in our gut, it gets into our blood, and it can eventually get into our brain. So when kids stop eating grain, all of a sudden they don't have autism. And nobody's really sure why that is, but one of the prevailing theories I've been re researching is that these particles in the blood may be causing fungus to grow in these areas. Now, interestingly enough, there's a whole, everybody's talked about, oh, you're going to kill brain cells, right? Yeah, you, well, it turns out there's neuroplasticity. So the brain can regrow. And I have some fascinating things in book two, volume two, about how people have regrown their brain tissue. It turns out that people who had diagnosable psychopathy were in some cases able to reduce the severity and regrow this brain tissue and apparently one of the best jobs to do it, believe it or not, is taxi cab driver. And you might laugh at me. I'm laughing about it right now. You can see I'm laughing. But what apparently is happening is that it, they're exposed to a bunch of different social situations. And over time, they start to lose their innate uh, hatred of other people, which unfortunately, that's what this condition seems to cause. A single instance of sexual abuse can cause people to sort of lobotomize themselves where, I mean, this is what I've talked about this extensively with my therapist who's an expert in, in uh, domestic violence, sexual abuse, etc. And part of why I continue working with her is, is for collaboration and research. So when somebody goes through a very intense trauma, sort of like the one I had yesterday, I mean, yesterday was one of the most horrible things that ever happened in the whole time I've been here. It was so loud, it was so crazy, it lasted for so long. I mean, it's nothing like a sexual assault, but it was bad. So when you have a really, really bad trauma, you don't remember it. It's called disassociation, and the body does this naturally. It naturally walls off a memory. So if you have something horrible happen to you, especially anything involving sexual attack, in almost all cases, you don't remember it. Some people do, but many, many, if not most people do not. And this is called, again, dissociation. Well, it appears that if enough of that dissociation lasts and you're not able to bring the memories back because you're getting traumatized so much, that your brain will selectively turn off certain areas in order for you to be able to tolerate being alive. But the problem is that along with that comes this whole ensemble of weird behaviors that, that are 
the checklist of narcissistic personality disorder. A very highly involved sense of self, you know, a very intense difficulty of getting along with anyone else. And I've tried to boil it down to the idea that a person who has NPD, narcissistic personality disorder, whatever you want to call it, a person with NPD, and I've, I've discussed with my therapist, actually, we've really gotten intense on this. They, they are not capable of loving someone beyond their own way of doing it, which is, interestingly enough, love and destroy. And I talk about that throughout the books, that there is this, they will not let you know that they want to destroy you. They keep that part hidden. They present a facade to you, which is that they love you, that they're supportive, but then you start getting more and more abuse. And there are three phases that I've identified. I've slightly modified them that we talk about in the book, which is, which is deify, denigrate, and discard. And so in the deification phase, they, in many cases, they end up having a romantic relationship with you. These usually, these kind of things usually play out in romantic relationships. So in the DFI phase, they're, they're having sex with you. They're really infatuated with you. They have all those hormones going and they, they worship you. They give you quality attention. They'll listen to you talk for hours. Everything seems great, except that periodically you're getting these really upsetting instances of abuse, which they then gloss over. And that's called DARVO, Deny, Attack, Reverse Victim and Offender. If you ever try to get close to their behavior, if you ever try to talk about the problem, if you ever try to heal our relationship, whatever you want to call it, and again, I studied this academically in college, it's been a key interest of mine all these years, they do this thing called DARVO, where the closer you try to get to the problem, the more that all these other bad things start happening. And that's why yesterday, in kind of a cosmic satanic darvo, if you will, how do these two different smoke alarms go bad within the same little four-hour period? I got up at 1.30, I go back to bed, there was no beeping. I get up again at 4.30, I'm awake for one hour, because again, up here you only sleep three or four hours at once, it's so dry, and you're always hungry and you're always thirsty. So you, you're always having to sleep and shift. That's one of the things that really sucks about being here. So I was up at 4.30 in the morning, and then I stayed awake until 5.30, and I go back to sleep, and I get up again at 8.30, and now it's going. And the dog's already in very advanced trauma. She's drooling. She's, you know, demanding to go outside immediately, or she's going to crap on the carpet. It was very intense. And I know my dog, and I know when she's that sick. So... Yeah, this is a Darvo. This is, this is something saying that the video that I'm going to do today, which I'm now at 90 minutes, it's probably about enough time, and we'll pick it up next week. I, I want to keep going. I want to keep doing this regularly. So the Darvo thing is a very significant issue because, again, Archangel Michael's primary message is that we have the good guys and the bad guys in the universe, but the true law is the law is one. So check this out. This is a, a great law of one quote. Now they're talking about how you have a pyramid initiation. You can be initiated in the queen's chamber or the king's chamber. As you may know, there's two big rooms inside the pyramid. If you go up the slope, there's one that comes off like this, and that's the, king's, the queen's chamber is here. If you follow the slope up the rest of the way, it goes out to the king's chamber. So queen and king, like that. So they're talking about what you get from being in the queen's chamber of the pyramid and getting this very concentrated burst of that geometric energy that is thought. If you can concentrate it and enhance it, you get a metamorphosis. And that's, it's a consciousness metamorphosis. It changes the way you think. It increases your IQ. It makes you a more loving, compassionate, forgiving person. And the real message of the Law of One, Archangel Michael, is that the universe is a class. You can hate that. You can say, well, I don't want to learn lessons and I'm just here to live my life. Well, that's okay, but the lessons are going to come anyway. And the real lesson is free will. They call it the first distortion, the most important lesson. The universe is one. So if you hurt somebody else, you're actually hurting yourself, and you are accountable for hurting yourself. That's just such an intrinsic teaching. And if we accepted that we're all one, 
and you know the the type of psychopathy of 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 love and destroy wouldn't happen. You don't feel this anger, you don't feel this grief inside. So let's look at this quote again. This is very interesting. Oops, I had it on the quote the whole time. I'm so sorry. That was my bad. I just uh, okay. So you guys were looking at that way too long. So it said, "The abandoning of the self to such." Let's do it again. Now that I'm now, oh, I, I wasn't on it. Okay, there we go. That's what's going on. Now I've got it. Now you're here. The initiation in the queen's chamber involved the abandoning of self to such desire to know the creator in full. Let's just. That's why I highlighted this abandoning of self. What is the abandoning of self necessarily? Well, it's talking about, you know, if, if you are beleaguered with narcissism, then you see your body as yourself. And many people wouldn't even realize that you could detach from that. But there is a way to get into a sort of overview perspective. And that's what the Tibetans were into. They taught empty awareness. The, the Tibetan Ascension Meditation is to meditate on the emptiness of the universe as being pure awareness. And that that is your awareness, and it is creating all of physical reality. So it says again here that you are abandoning yourself to such a desire to know the Creator in full, that purified in-streaming light is drawn in through a balanced fashion through all your energy centers or chakras, meeting in your inner eye chakra to open the gate to intelligent infinity, thus activating Christ type of capabilities, actually. Then, true life is experienced, or as your people call it, resurrection. Well, we know about resurrection, right? That's a classic Christian dogma. When you understand what the Law of One is saying and what Archangel Michael is saying in Michael prophecies, it's, it's a much more expansive view of positive good guy ETs than anything we've seen in religion before. And that really was started with the Edgar Cayce readings, the, the 1950s human ET channelings, the Seth material that was in the late 1960s, early 1970s, and then the Law of One material in the 80s. These, to me, are the premier go-to sources. And when this contact started for me, I had no idea that I was going to end up in gay clothes with a fetish whip right here. I'm ready to see if you're bad, and if you're bad, you're going to get this, okay? It's loud, and I will be very gentle. This is a loving, caressing, I'll, I'll kind of rub it around a little bit first and then give you a whack so that you're kind of aware that it's coming. You know, that's important. It's, it's a more ethical choice in how you choose to deal with your BDSM gear, which is a key part of your curriculum at Gender Studies University. So... Uh, if <laughs> I'm not I'm not trying to do anything other than laugh because I love to laugh and I love to make fun of myself and so yes I kind of love this outfit and it's also like Las Vegas and very ridiculous at the same time but hey you're still here you got 7,229 people live that's enough for the meditation effect so resurrection true life what do they mean what do they mean by true life or resurrection well. Here we go. They say, one meets the self in the center or in the deeps of the being. It is analogous to the burial and resurrection of the body, wherein the entity dies to the self, and through this confrontation of apparent loss and the realization of essential gain, is transmuted into a new and risen being. And I just realized I spelled new wrong. Ouch. I spelled K-N-E-W. <laughs> but you know what? That's what happens. Sometimes you're in the flow and you don't really pick these things up. So there's a lot of cool stuff here because it's talking about the death and resurrection process. That's what the pyramid was intended to do, create initiation. It's very dark and scary. You're walking through this long claustrophobic corridor. The, the ceiling is way too low. You have to crouch down to get up that ascending passage. It's bad. And then finally, the ceiling rises halfway up, and then you can climb the rest of the way up through what's called the Grand Gallery, and you end up at the top into the King's Chamber. Now, this was talking about the Queen's Chamber because apparently there were two different types of initiation that you could have in the Pyramid. You could have a Queen's Chamber or a King's Chamber initiation. But again, they're saying that it, it, there is a... 
when you go into the king's chamber sarcophagus or in the queen's chamber the sarcophagus you actually lean into a niche in the wall that's in the shape of a human body roughly either way it works you go through some type of weird sort of hallucinogenic bad trip where all this evil comes after you and your body gets eaten your body gets eaten by maybe animals or something like that that's the shamanic death and that's something that happened to me very recently a profound experience I had where crows a flock of about 60 crows shot through my body in a, in a kind of consciousness sense and dissolved my body like each each there was each crow came in a wave of seven and it was like getting shot with bullets and and in this vision my body was disintegrating and it eventually completely went away and I was just a keyhole and now all the crows are shooting through this keyhole and that's all I was and at the time I was very upset thinking my dog's about to die and I had that fear again yesterday because of as I said all these weird behaviors apparently just caused by the noise thank God but I did not know if she was gonna stay alive it was looking really bad and then the firemen were telling me yeah animals a lot of times have trouble with this but that just added to the trauma so Gurley is the name of my dog and you know I call her that because everybody thinks it's a boy so I, I just said okay you know what I'm just gonna change your name to Gurley because I always end up having this gender identity discussion about my dog <laughs> yeah she kinda looks masculine but she is a girl so it's Gurley so we'll just call her Gurley and then we're done with it nothing to worry about I just she she heard her name you know she's very 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 intelligent and that's kind of a problem because she's a shepherd which means she manipulates you and tries to get you to do what she wants not always a good thing so this vision you know was happening right in the middle of well I'm very concerned about whether Gurley's gonna stay alive because she can't go to the bathroom because it's so freaking cold up here this winter has been absolutely biblical so cold so insane so then I have this vision of the crows and they show me that I'm not my body and they they just basically shot me and dissolved my body into this into this keyhole that they were flying through and I cried I mean it was very intense and it was along the same lines as the apparition of Mother Mary experience which I don't want to try to describe here I will end up crying if I try to talk about it uh, and it's 333 right as I say that mountain time how about that but I will say that the strangest part of the Mary experience for me because I had this entity show up in the room basically and it was it was incredibly powerful and it felt like I was dying one of the main sensations I had was of my sense of touch spreading out on these golden rays past my physical body so like the tactile feeling of your hands your arms your fingers all of a sudden there's these rays going through you and the rays spread out and that's you and your sense of touch and your sense of bodily corporeal reality is on these freaking rays that are spreading and then they 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 contact the wall and you can feel the walls oh man is it weird and it's 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 if you get the full high octane version of it it's really intense I've had a couple other ones since then that were not quite as intense and as, as difficult. The crow thing basically blasted me into the same space. And I had another one where my head tried to open up. And that's when I learned that I still have to fix some of these uh, muscular blockages. They're, the muscular blockages will stop the ascension from happening unless you go through this thing that happens all at once that they've been talking about so um, let's see if there's another law of one quote here that's really good for us to end on yeah this is a good one so the law of one let's go back to the slide here the law of one says that all things are the one creator thus seeking the creator is done not just in meditation and in the work of the adept but in the experience of every moment. Hmm. The seeking of the Creator is done in the experience of every moment. And they explain that the most important thing to seek in the moment is love. So let me go ahead to that. I think I have that down here. Explain. 
yeah, here we go. This is, this is really the core of the Law of One philosophy, and I'm still keeping it to around 90 minutes. We're going to do meditation in a minute. I'll keep it under two hours. But this is the core of the whole thing, folks. Here we go. The heart of the discipline of the personality is threefold. Number one, know yourself. Number two, accept yourself. Number three, become the creator. Oh, heresy, heresy, heresy. Well, wait a minute. Jesus in John 14, 12, this is my favorite Bible quote. As I do these things, meaning miracles, walking on water, raising Lazarus from the dead, feeding 5,000 people from some loaves and fishes that were not very many, whatever that was, he says, as I do these miracles, so shall you do them and greater things, for I go unto my father, mother God. So the law of one actually reaffirms this, which is that you, you know yourself, which, which, is, which is understanding who you are and really being honest about your strengths and weaknesses. And are you living the life that you could be living? Are you living up to your highest potential? Accepting yourself has to do with being loving. And then when it says become the creator, whoa, what's that all about? Well, that's not something we're used to hearing, and that's because negative forces do not want you to become the creator. They do not want you to love yourself. They do not want you to understand that you're a spiritual being. They don't want you to get the message of the crows where they fly through you and you realize your body doesn't exist or that you have these rays that, you know, connect to everything around you. Yet, this is the reality, but it doesn't mean that you turn into a jerk. In fact, it's just the opposite. This is the most beautiful part of the quote right here. The third step, once accomplished, renders one the most humble servant of all humanity, transparent in personality, and completely able to know and accept other people. So once you've been through this healing process, there would be no thing, there would be no hate on earth to worry about, you see. As we become self-loving, self-accepting, as we learn that self-acceptance is the bullseye, no matter how crazy and deep your esoteric scholarship might be, and if you're a David Wilcock fan watching these videos, it's probably deep, never forget that the bullseye is to love yourself. And if you're not actively working on that, which I think a very important part of loving yourself is meditation. If you, if you don't meditate, then you're not going to be able to heal those parts of the brain that may have been weakened and shut down or partially shut down from trauma. We've all been through trauma, post-COVID especially, and so each one of us might have parts of our brain that require new myelination, that require neuroplasticity. Uh, R.D. Lang, L-A-I-N-G, I learned about him in college, and he cured people of schizophrenia by bringing them out in the woods and having them garden and do like digging up weeds and planting seeds and watering it and watching the seeds grow and then eating the vegetables. Uh, it was a nature-based therapy, and now we know that schizophrenia has many of the same neurological abnormalities that we see with psychopathy. So again... In the new Michael Prophecies book that's about to come out, I break down 10 regions of the brain, what they do, scientific evidence, proof that, this, that trauma can shut these areas down, and we talk about strategies that can open them back up, like being a taxi cab driver. And there's other things too. It's not just that. You don't have to drive a taxi. But I do think a lot of people get through their own adolescent trauma by having entry-level jobs and many of those entry-level jobs, if you're a teenager and you got to work, it's very similar to a taxi cab driver, isn't it? Because people keep coming up and they need food, and you're talking to them and you're interacting. And I do think that the three years of very mundane jobs I had after college really did help me get over a lot of the trauma of how badly I was bullied by everyone growing up. Uh, mostly because I was so intelligent, and it was obvious as soon as I spoke and people would act out with jealousy and anger about that. So if you become the creator, then you are the most humble and transparent servant of all. And so this kind of echoes why I, I still did the show after this crazy thing yesterday. I said, you know what? 
the whole reason why two smoke alarms went down at the same time there's a biblical windstorm, it's very cold, the same time my dog's having this weird sickness, the reason why this happened is to show me how important it is that I get back on camera because something doesn't want me to do it. There's negative forces out there. The Law of One talks about this extensively. You know, there are negative entities and they don't usually ever materialize in physical form. That's very rare and it would only usually happen in, in the so-called live offering, which is a gross thing to talk about. But anyway, we all have this ability to either listen to the darkness or listen to the light. We have both influences speaking to us all the time. I hate to say it because I know some people would want this to be true, but you cannot have one deliverance experience and, and then cast away all of these influences. As a human being, part of the contract that we have is that positive sources influence us when we have positive thoughts, and negative sources influence us when we have negative thoughts. If you start getting sad, negative forces will make you want to be more sad. If you start getting angry, negative forces will nudge you to get more angry. If you're overwhelmed, they'll try to make you more overwhelmed. So the way negative greeting works is it actually can, in some cases, attack electronic objects. That's why it's so weird that I lost two smoke alarms within four hours of each other one of which was on a 20-year cycle, the other of which I'd unplugged maybe a year and a half ago and just tossed it in a box, which is why it was so hard to find. It took us forever to find that thing. Yesterday was so horrible. It was so horrible. But I said, no, I'm going to still do the show. Because I see that what's happening in the world right now is reaching an apex point. I don't know how fast, but like there's a lot of things that are really, really coming to a head all at once. It's very overwhelming, it's very intense, and Michael guides us through the whole thing. It's like you get a, a nice hand-over-hand -hand experience to make sense out of this craziness. So again, it's a prophetic work, it's got tons and tons and tons of accurate prophecies about our present, and it was all documented in the 1990s, published online, forensically dated back to hard drives, printouts, and online stored copies on archive.org. But if you try to read it that way, you're never going to be able to figure out what's going on. I, I analyze it sometimes almost line by line. I also put all the prophecies in red. Now, in the author's preface area, the red sections are actually more about emphasis. It's not a prophecy necessarily. Sometimes I put things in red for emphasis. But once you get into the main body of Michael prophecy text, which is massive, I was remote viewing these words for four years, all, you know, three, four times a week. And it was all stuff that relates to now. That's why I kept doing the practice, but it was very frustrating because so much of it didn't make any sense at all. It was like just very impenetrable and mysterious. And so, you know, there's several references to Donald Trump. There's several references to Joe Biden, Joe Biden's wife. I mean, it's just, I don't even know where to begin. You have to actually read it, take the time, and I know some people don't want to read. So again, the product, when you, buy, when you buy the product, if you go there now and you buy it, you're getting all five of the books and all five of the audio books, but you're also helping me develop the product because I haven't had time to finish it as fast as I thought, and Michael needed me to be held back so that history would play out and then prophetic experiences show up in the text. There's tons of those. It's amazing what's been going on. I'm, I'm very close now to releasing the next book. I, I would have probably already had it done, except that thankfully you guys did step up. Thank you so much. You guys actually did support me financially, and so I was able to address seven different very bad debts. I mean, not the big one. The, the tax debt, I have a couple tax debts that are massive, and I'm nowhere near that, but... I paid off taxes on, on the house I grew up in, uh, which my mom is now renting. So that's really great because we got a tenant now. And um, it was very inexpensive. It was, you know, I, I grew up in poverty. So you live in LA and you can throw $100,000 into a house. It's like, wow, that's kind of like using a house as a bank. So that's what I did. But nobody's ever lived there. And now we're getting that all straightened out, which is great. So I had, you know, funny little debts that I hadn't worked out with New York, and I got all that stuff straightened out. 
So thankfully, um, I've, I've rehabilitated myself so that I'm not in some type of weird, crazy biblical catastrophe like I was basically for the last year and a half kicking the can around, never having enough money, rarely ever having more than $10,000 at once, and often a lot less. Uh, so Archangel Michael required me to renounce, you know, these cameras, doing shows, and, 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 and wealth. It's, it's been a very intense struggle here, and I've been working constantly, but I'm now very close to being finished. And what I see is that as the books are being finished, so too are we seeing this global thing that's happening, the liberation, the, the, the cosmic divorce is reaching ahead. And so one of Michael's main messages is that we as a planet are going through what you could think of as a divorce with a psychopath. The psychopath is going to want to destroy you on the way out. And as you try to end the relationship and break it up, and again, remember I studied this in college, they will hit you harder and harder and more and more often. And so what's happening right now in my view, uh, and, the, and the book that I'm working on right now, book two, volume two, talks about this. The Chinese balloon was meant to freak us out. The East Palestine chemical spill was meant to freak us out. All the stuff that's happening with the food supply. There's so many things all happening at the same time to try to make you upset. And that is the death to the self. That is the initiation. That is the shamanic death. We're going through it on a collective level. In order to escape a dysfunctional relationship like this, you have to learn not to get mad when the person provokes you. That's the biggest thing. And so we see this over and over again. The reason why I made some satirical slides about Gender Studies University, which is not true. I mean, maybe it will be now because they, they emulate me a lot of the time. So now GSU is a thing. But in Wichita, Kansas, I don't know why I picked that, but I... I just thought it would be really funny to add that one in. So, some of the people in the patriot community are getting very angry at homosexuals, LGBT, whatever you want to call it. I don't think this is a good idea. That's what they want. These people are being abused just like the rest of us. They're being lied to just like the rest of us. They're being manipulated. And obviously, the Hell's Kitchen statistic that I showed, where nobody wants to drink Bud Light in the gay community, would make it appear that as a whole, the gay community is not falling for this. So I don't want you to think that they are, and I certainly don't want you to buy into the, the propaganda that you're being fed, which is to hate these people if you're not one of them, if that's not the way that you feel. So we can all be friends and we can get along and everything can be fine. And within two years, Archangel Michael is saying that we're going through a non-catastrophic ascension for everyone on earth. There's going to be many, many LGBT people in that group, undoubtedly. And so we're all going to get to make it. And, and the, the classic elite strategy is divide and conquer. They like to spread us apart and, and create all this mayhem, but we don't need to feed into that. So in the last 10 minutes here, I'm going to keep it under two hours. We will do our global meditation. So let me, let me start that now. I'd like you to put both feet flat on the floor. Close your eyes. Let yourself feel very deeply relaxed. And as you continue to breathe deeper and deeper, you see that at the core of soul's evolution is the love that we feel for all others. The Christian message of Jesus is to love your enemies to love others as you love yourself. And there are forces in the world today that seek to divide us, turn us against one another, create hatred, division, and separation, and feelings of enmity, disgust, animosity, and anger. But in the purity, in the quietude of the moment, there is an oasis of love that is always there and always available to you. And it is waiting for you to simply tune in and feel the vibration. 
There's really nothing that you have to do. That's the great part about meditation. You just let it happen. You just create the habitat. Create the space. And as you go through your life, learning to take things with less anger, more patience, not to be so reactive around other people, to think before we speak, to hold back and consider the consequences of what someone else might feel if we were to say something angry or unloving. Going deeper and deeper into the medicine of pure healing, exploring the journey that can be found as that point of stillness is expanded and your awareness no longer is contained within the body but stretches into your chair, into the floor, into the walls around you, bringing you closer and closer to a sense of perfect interconnectedness with all that is. Tuning in deeper and deeper, exploring the depths of the shadow self, those parts of the psyche that we thought could not be loved, could not be accepted. Well, as it turns out, our job is to just let go of all that. Just let go of all the shame, all the self-judgment, all the anxiety, all the fear. And relax into the notion that we are on a perfect timeline, experiencing a perfect plan for humanity's soul evolution, where all of us get to experience ascension, the activation of new potentials in our consciousness, the understanding of new forms of living, new technologies, hover cars, free energy power plants, space travel, and meeting up with our galactic brotherhood and sisterhood. The promises have been made and they are being kept. Prophecy is self-referential. As more and more prophecies come true, the likelihood that the future that is laid out for us becomes ever greater of a reality. And that is a positive future, not a negative one. For as difficult, as painful, as traumatic, and as seemingly insoluble as the world is now, just like this crazy beeping thing with the smoke alarms that I experienced, we will find the source of the sound. We will track it down. We will turn over every rock until it's found. And we will heal our world. Evil does not get to win. Goodness triumphs. And peace, brotherhood, and companionship become the new standard by which this world is measured. No longer do we need to feel angered if someone tries to tell us that we are not good enough or we're not smart enough or attractive enough. For we know that in our core there is peace and there is a cosmic identity so much greater. Nothing can threaten that identity. We are not threatened by the apparent shamanic death of the old world. We are invigorated by the possibility that this ascension upgrade could indeed happen within two years, just as Michael is saying. That we will get our diploma, we will graduate, and we will no longer be in such a miserable existence. We will all learn how to be far more loving and accepting of one another and our differences, and learn how to embrace one another and accept one another with peace. And so it is. Ah, how does that feel? You guys feel good? 
Somebody said you had a video on pyramids ascending in 2030. Now you say within two years. Well, this is an important point. Um, the two-year thing is brand new. You have to understand, I dictated all these words, and as I said last week, um, they stayed. Let's, let's freshen up. I'll get a completely different camera approach here. How about that? There we go. So make it a little bit more visually stimulating on the way out. So I, I went through this stuff for years, reading about these, these prophecies. Uh, I, I channeled it all. I, I wrote it down. A lot of interesting things happened when it happened, but I never went back, I never read it, and I never really knew what I had gotten. And all that changed beginning uh, in September of 2021, as I was working on The Disclosure. That's why you got to go to thedisclosure.com. And I began discovering that there was all these prophecies in my old stuff about the defeat of the military-industrial complex, the evil part of it at least, that there would be something equivalent to a coup over the military-industrial complex involving positive sources. Well, when I got into these books, I discovered that pretty much everything that they say is, is prophetic of what's happening now. And therefore, when you, when you have five books of this material, it's freaking massive. This is a massive amount of data. And I don't expect you to read it all at once. And again, some of you may want to wait for the audio. I'm going to try to get that done as soon as I can. But I did not know what these words said because I didn't write the words. So it's, it's new to me that they're saying, you know, that by 2025 that we will have had this happen. That's the latest it can be. Um, it really has to be experienced. It's a multidimensional consciousness. It's instructing you on a, on a, on a cellular level. And uh, so when you read this, sometimes the words don't make any sense and you have to kind of meditate. It's teaching you how to be intuitive. It's teaching you how to listen to the voice of the guidance and keep this thing going. So, um, yeah, I'm out of time. It's under two hours. That's a great thing to shoot for. So now we're going to crush in on my extreme close-up. Uh-oh, here we go. Let's make sure I'm in focus. All right, so thank you for being here, and thank you so much for supporting my work so I was able to pay my bills. That was so awesome. Uh, I really want us to all be nice to each other. And I think laughter can heal a lot of these divides. So please bear with me for the satire that I do. I like, I like the fetish whip. You know, I, I, it's just part of my lifestyle. So anyway, thank you for being here. And... Uh...